getting into the lives of our neighbors and uh, just loving on them. We have neighbors all around us who uh, are in deep need. Uh, we have neighbors who are lonely, who are poor, who are ill. Uh, we've got to get into the lives of our neighbors and love them as we would expect to be loved and treated. Uh, and moving those people to loving God, teaching them who God is, uh, sharing with people who God is and how to fall in love with God and how to worship God, and moving those people and each other to serving others. Um, I often quote from uh, James when James says, faith without works is dead. Um, if we claim to have faith but we don't help people and we don't step in whenever we see a need, um, our faith is dead. Uh, our theme this year is straining toward the goal. Uh, and theme verses are Philippians 3, 13 and 14. And Paul says this, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, 2022 was, um, I think it's safe to say, one of the hardest and most exciting years um, in my family's history. Um, it's hard to believe it was only two years ago uh, in the summer of 22 when we were saying goodbye to my oldest sister, Michelle. Uh, Michelle had been struggling uh, for months spent seven months in the hospital, uh, very critical in ICU. Uh, she was transferred pretty much immediately, uh, you know, within a month or so from being at Connemaw, she was transferred to Pittsburgh. And um, I've talked about uh, that fateful day some here, but I never um, shared what I'm going to share today. Um, all of the family had come in, and you know, we have a, a large family. Um, we were trying to do the math the other day. Mom knows best, but how many grandkids are there? 25, 25 grandkids. So, you know, um, I'm number six of 11. Um, we all have had children, most of us, and you know, there are 25 grandkids. It's a big family. And uh, that was in, in, like, in the height of COVID restrictions, and so they would only allow a certain number of people to go visit Michelle. But we got the call uh, that not only was she very critical, but that she had uh, no chance of survival. Uh, my brother Tim, who's a doctor at Vanderbilt, uh, he came up immediately. He consulted with doctors. I've, I've shared that. Uh, he came to the same conclusion that on paper, uh, there was no possible way for her to survive. Um, her vital organs by that point have, had given up. Um, she, uh, she was very, very critical and was showing all the signs of, uh, end, of end of stage, end of life. Um, and I, I remember us all gathering outside, uh, outside the hospital at Pittsburgh, and of course that kind of news, uh, you know, we knew that she had been really sick, but we had been holding on to hope. And uh, as we saw her progressively get worse, um, that hope began to diminish. Um, and we all were standing outside and we had to, to figure out um, a schedule for who was allowed to see her and who couldn't get to say their final goodbyes to her. And I can't begin to describe to you um, how cruel that is um, and how hard that is to not be able to say goodbye to somebody who you know is literally feet away um, fighting for their life who most likely is not going to make it through the day. Uh, I was one of the ones who volunteered to not say goodbye to her. Um, I had been up, you know, with mom visiting and, you know, I'd seen her several times uh, over the past seven months. And um, I chose to not say goodbye because I, I had kind of made my peace with the fact that, uh, you know, my last visit with her was a good one. And I knew that, um, I, just, I just knew that other people needed that opportunity. Um, what absolutely blew me away 
is that there was one person among the dozens of people uh, who were gathered there at the hospital who 100% absolutely refused to give up. And I've got to give Michelle's husband, Paul, all the credit in the world because it was, it was not driven by false hope. It wasn't driven by just sheer determination. Uh, it wasn't driven by uh, kind of guesswork. It was driven by faith. And he absolutely refused to resign himself to the idea that Michelle was going to die. Like, absolutely would not utter those words. He wouldn't think it. He said, we are going to keep believing that God is going to step in and God is going to perform a miracle. I remember standing back and marveling at that faith and saying, God, I wish that I had an ounce of that kind of faith, you know, because in my mind, I was planning a funeral because I knew I was going to be the one officiating a funeral. Um, I knew that what we were hearing from the doctors was that there was absolutely zero hope. There was none. Um, and I remember standing back and, and looking at Paul and thinking, who's going to be the one to tell him? Who's going to be the one to tell him when she finally passes that that faith that he was holding on to didn't work. And I remember uh, later on that night, whenever we got the news, and I've shared this part of the story with you all, that we got the news that once my little niece was able to go visit Michelle, that immediately uh, all of her, her ports, like all the fluids, the draining fluids just started flowing. She, I mean, I forget how many cc's they pulled off of her, but, but the doctors described it as an indescribable phenomenon. Uh, we Christians call that a miracle. Um, and so fast forward to today, uh, Michelle's doing so good, and every time we see her, it's, it's a reminder that faith is so important. And so today, uh, the lesson is on the centurion who um, Jesus marveled at his faith. And I want to take away a couple misconceptions, first of all, because we think of faith as something that we do, that, that we're going to build our faith, we're going to work on our faith, we're going to somehow increase our faith. And that idea is not even alluded to in Scripture whatsoever. Faith and belief are very different. Faith, faith is something, it comes, really comes from the word patho, which means to persuade. Uh, the Greek word is pistis, uh, but it comes from the word patho. Uh, patho means to be persuaded by someone, or in this case, in every case that faith is used in the Bible, to be persuaded by the divine to receive divine persuasion that God himself is going to do something in our life. And I think that makes sense because uh, in Luke 17, remember uh, what the disciples said? Uh, Jesus was talking about temptations to sin. And he says, if you're, you know, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. And the very next verse, I love this. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. You give us more of your faith. And this is how faith works throughout the scriptures. It's, again, it's not something we do, it's something we receive. It's a divine opening up of ourselves to receive this divine faith. To know and acknowledge in our heart, in our core, that God is going to do something. And I kind of think of it this way. Um, sometimes we don't receive well. We don't receive messages well, husbands, right? 
we're not very good at receiving messages well. Um, I'm especially terrible at it. I, you know, I zone out. I, my mind is usually in a million different places. And if we think about receiving God's faith, um, part of that is dependent upon us. Right? So faith isn't something that we do. It's not something that we work on. But receiving that faith is. And saying, God, I am willing to humbly submit to you, and I'm willing to receive an increased measure of your faith. Uh, but I think about this, um, you know, I used to drive truck back in the day. And you have CB radios that are, you know, they go like four miles at best. On a good day, they go four miles. But sometimes, when the weather conditions were different, um, there's, there's a thing called uh, sky, sky hopping. And it's where the ionosphere changes and the signals start hitting those ions in the ionosphere and they actually start skipping and they bounce. And so some days I could hear people, uh, believe it or not, from California and I'd be like on top of the ship hotel and there was this skipping where I could receive what typically would be three miles, four miles max. Um, I was getting from 2,500 miles away. Um, some days, believe it or not, I was getting signals and I could hear people talk as if they were sitting in the cab of my truck from Australia, literally from around the world. And so this tiny weak signal when the ionosphere is just right, uh, it can actually skip literally around the world uh, until somebody finally receives that signal. And it's really, it's a, it's a bizarre phenomenon. But I think about our faith that way, where when we're really attentive and we really listen and we're really willing to humbly receive God's faith, um, God will put his faith and let it rest on us. And I, I, I promise you, I witnessed this with my brother-in-law uh, to where I just was absolutely blown away. Um, I'm just going to read just a tiny bit from Hebrews 11. It's known as the faith chapter. And if you think about faith that way, this makes a lot of sense. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Right? This is not... This is not his faith that he built, that he worked on. This is God's faith, God's divine persuasion that he gave these people where they received it humbly and then God showed up. This is the full text um, of this story that we just heard a part of this morning, uh, beginning in Luke 7, chapter 1. After he, that is Jesus, after Jesus had finished all of his sayings in the hearing of, of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. Isn't that an interesting response? This is not a Jewish person. This is a, a Roman centurion who heard of Jesus and he sends Jewish elders. Um, by the way, if you understand how the Roman uh, ranking works and the government, the, the, you, don't, you don't do that. You don't send as a centurion the, you know, the peon little elders to their own people to beg one of those, one of their people to come and to heal your servant. So you can automatically see the humility that this, uh, that this centurion has. 
And, by the way, his message isn't come and, and, and eyeball my servant and you know, give me advice for what to do. He believed fully in his heart that Jesus had the ability. He didn't even question it. I saw that with my brother-in-law. I saw that with Paul. I'm telling you it was different than what any one of us in the family had. Paul looked directly at us and he said, she will be made well. I know it. And when they came to Jesus, verse 4, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him for he loves our nation and he's the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Do you hear what's going on? He sends the elders, the Jewish elders, to Jesus and says, please heal my servant. He never said, please come heal my servant. He said, please heal my servant. And the Jewish people say, God, or Jesus, he's worthy for you to do this because he's friendly to the Jews. He's friendly to us, and he built one of our synagogues with his own money. And Jesus is intrigued, and he begins walking. And when the man finds out, when the centurion finds out that Jesus is walking toward the house, he intercepts him. He sends friends to stop him and say, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my own roof. In verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had, who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. I love this story on a whole bunch of different levels. Because I see this centurion, this man who wasn't working on his faith. He wasn't, you know, trying to build his faith. He just received it. And he trusted God and he leaned into God. And he said, I know who you are. I think that's so incredible. And I think when we read our Bibles, sometimes we get tripped up and we get caught up on you know, trying to, trying to piecemeal things together and, you know, we're trying to figure God out. We're trying to figure out the right arguments that we can give people so we can, like, you know, hit them with scriptures. And, and I don't see the centurion doing that. I see the centurion opening himself up to this divine persuasion, to this faith that God puts on him. And he says, God, I know who you are. And I believe and I trust. And I know that you'll do this for my servant. And he's so humble about it. He's not pushy and he's not arrogant and he's not demanding that people do things for him. He is extremely humble and he submits himself to the will of God. And I look at this story... And I look at the story of my sister and I look at the story of so many other people who I've witnessed this level of faith and I think how, how much easier could we breathe in life if we opened ourselves up to God's divine persuasion, to faith, if we opened ourselves up to receive faith from God and we just prayed instead of wrestling back and forth and trying to figure things out and, you know, getting into arguments and whatever it is. What if we just leaned into God and said, this was our prayer, right? God, increase my faith.
And I trust you to increase my faith. And I trust you to do these things that I pray for because I know who you are. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've read it. I've witnessed it in my own life. I know who you are. And there is no other entity that's like you. There's no other person that's like you. There's no other God out there that's like you. I know who you are. And if you go back and you reread Hebrews 11, this is exactly the people that's being described in the faith chapter. Noah, right? He leans into who God is. He's told to do this. People think he's absolutely insane. He wasn't like having 600 faith lessons on how to build your faith overnight. He just leaned into it, and he did it, and he accepted God's faith. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. I love, I love when we see people who receive this faith, who receive this divine persuasion by God, who willingly and humbly accept it and they open themselves up to it. And I'm telling you, when you open yourself up to this kind of faith, God does absolutely incredible things in the life of you, in the life of your family, in the life of the church, in the life of the kingdom, in the life of people around the world. It's incredible. We just talked about it in class this morning. The things that happened that were so paradoxical that Paul, a person who was persecuting the church, ends up being sent by Jesus himself is incredible. Absolutely incredible, but that happened through faith. So my prayer is that this week we open ourselves up to receive an increase in God's faith. That we ask God to increase our faith. That we open ourselves up and we open our eyes and we can see the people around us who are struggling and suffering and that we just we don't even think about it. Right? Because a lot of times we stop and we think and we recalculate and we're like, okay, will this work out? Well, I don't know. Do I have the time to do it? Uh, I don't know. If you notice the people with this level of faith that the centurion had, they just instinctively do things. He didn't think about this. Uh, well, I mean, maybe he thought about it a lot, but, but he instinctively sends the elders. He instinctively sends his friends. He instinctively knew that Jesus was going to heal his servant. He just knew it. And when we get in tune with God, we instinctively know what to do. We instinctively know who to pray for, how to pray for them, who to serve, how to get into the lives of people. So that's my prayer this week, is that God increases our faith and that he puts people in our path um, very intentionally who we can bless, who need to be blessed. Bless you all as you go out this week. Um, if there's anybody with prayer needs or anybody who's not yet taken that step to put Christ on a baptism and you're ready, um, we could uh, certainly do that today. You could come up as we all stand and sing this song together. Hey,